There's that contrast in the chants we repeat in the evening before we meditate. There's the chant on aging, illness, and death, separation. Then there's the chant that says, May I be happy. In the context of aging, illness, and death, that wish for happiness seems a little, a little hopeless, but it's not. It's why we're here. Because that original chant doesn't stop with aging, illness, and death, and separation. It goes on to talk about your actions. Your actions do have a power to shape your life, and you want to do them well. In fact, the Buddha says the actions can become so skillful that you get to the point where you find something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die. Big earthquake. And so where do your actions come from? They come from the mind. Really big earthquake. Those chants simply remind us that if you're looking for happiness, you have to look at the causes and not latch on to the effects. This body we have, the situation we're in, that, that comes from our actions. But if you try to hold on to these things without really thinking about how skillful your actions are, you're going to get into trouble. You want to focus on the mind that's doing the actions, the mind that's making the intentions, and train that well. And John Sawat made this point. He said the Buddha talks about all the things that are not self, not self. Those are the results of actions. He said the Buddha Howard does say that we're the owners of our actions. That's what we're responsible for. So you get set good things in motion, you set some unskillful things in motion, but you don't try to latch on to them. You keep focusing on the fact that you've got to return to what you're doing right here, right now. And you want to make sure you do it skillfully. That's the meaning of the not-self teaching. A lot of people are scared off by the teaching on not-self. sounds like the Buddha is saying we have no self, or there's nothing, that's nothing to us, or that we have to deny ourselves. That's not the case. He's simply asking you to focus on what's really worthy of your full attention. And be careful you don't try to latch on to things that could make you behave in unskillful ways. We fight so much for our survival, we fight for maintaining relationships, and often we do very unskillful things. And that sets bad conditions into motion. So you want to turn around and focus on the source. Make sure the source is creating something good and everything else gets taken care of. And the source is right here, which is why we meditate right here. We don't meditate on big abstractions. We focus on something simple like the breath that's right here, right next to the mind. When you've got the mind with the breath, then you can see it clearly. So take a good long, deep in and out breath. And notice where you feel the breathing in the body. And if long breathing feels good, keep it up. If it doesn't feel good, you can change. This is one of the nice things about the breath. It's an automatic function of the body, but it's also one that you can have some control over. So try to 
learn how to exert some skillful control. What kind of breathing would feel really good right now? If you're feeling tired, what kind of breathing will be energizing? If you're feeling tense, what kind of breathing would be more relaxing? You can try short, long, heavy, light, deep, shallow, fast, slow. There are lots of ways of working with the breath and the body. Lots of different ways of perceiving the breath and the body. It's not just the air coming in and out of the lungs, it's the flow of energy that goes through the chest, goes through the stomach. And if you're very sensitive, you can sense it in any part of the body, the flow of energy that allows the air to come in go out. Any thoughts that are not related to the breath, just let them go, because you don't want to get involved in any narratives that would pull you away. If you do get pulled away, just drop the thought and you'll be right back here. Get pulled away again. As soon as you notice you're pulled away, drop the thought and you'll be back, back here again. It's normal when you're getting started that there will be distracting thoughts going around, but each time you catch yourself you're strengthening a quality called alertness, where you're watching what you're doing, seeing clearly what you're doing. That's a quality you want to develop if you want to understand your own mind. So you practice it with the breath. At the same time, you're developing mindfulness, the ability to keep something in mind. In this case, keep in mind what you want to do. And if you've had any experience meditating and you know what helps and what doesn't help with the mind, okay, remember that. Apply it. As for issues that came up in the course of the day that are not related to the breath, you don't want to remember those for the time being. Just put them aside. Thoughts of who did what to you or what you did to other people, just spread thoughts of goodwill to everybody. Because when you're looking for happiness here, there's no competition. When you're out in the world, there's a lot of competition. A lot of one-upsmanship, and worse. Because everything in the world seems to have its owner. And if you want to find your happiness and things out there, you're going to have to fight off a few other owners. But here, this is your breath. These are your actions, and not anybody else's. So when you're looking for happiness here, it's a lot easier to have goodwill for everybody it's when you're not competing. It's like that image of Mercury in The Sirens of Titan, where the animals live off the vibrations of the planet. They don't have to feed off of one another. There's plenty of space throughout the planet for everybody. And so they send messages of goodwill to one another. When you look for your happiness inside, you find it a lot easier to live with other people in the world, because you don't have to compete. You've got a good source of happiness right here, and that's actually a much better happiness than the things outside. The word outside here meaning anything beginning with your body and going out. So bring an attitude of goodwill to yourself and goodwill for everybody. And focus here to get to know this area of your awareness as thoroughly as possible. When the breath starts feeling comfortable, there may be a tendency to start drifting off as the mind gravitates toward the comfort rather than to the breath. So to counteract that tendency, the next step is to think about the whole body as you breathe in, the whole body as you breathe out and relax the whole body around the breathing process. That will allow the feelings of ease of the breath to spread down the nerves, down the blood vessels. 
You can think of those feelings of ease spreading out to every pore of the skin. And if you're really sensitive, it feels like the whole body's breathing. Then try to maintain that sense of whole body. Whole body awareness, a whole body feeling of pleasure, the whole body breathing. That helps to anchor your awareness here in the present moment. If your range of awareness is small, it's like a little tiny bead that can slip off to the future, slip off to the past. As if thoughts going to the future and the past where you had to go through a little tube. But here your awareness is so large it can't fit through the tube. So you're here in the present moment, anchored in the present moment. And this is where you can see things clearly. Because those actions that shape our lives, where do they come from? They come from right here. Your intentions right here in the present moment. A part of the mind that we're all too rarely aware of. It happens many times. You ask somebody, well, why did you do X? And they have to stop and think for a bit. The intention wasn't all that clear. And yet it's your intentions that shape your actions. Your actions shape your life. So it's just plain common sense. Pay careful attention to your intentions and get the mind here in the present moment as much as you can. So you can see the quality of thinking that goes into those intentions. Anything that would pull you away from this, you have to say, oh, that's just not me right now. That's what the meaning of not-self is. If you identify with something that's going to make you behave in an unskillful way, you've got to learn how to, to realize, look, okay, the identification was a choice you made. And again, it was a choice that was made without much awareness. But now that you're more aware of what's going on in the mind, you can see it. When the Buddha talks about yourself, he doesn't answer the question of whether you have a self or don't have a self, but he says you are engaged in what he calls I-making and my-making. You create your sense of what's important to you, what you want to hold on to, your sense of what you're able to do. You're constantly creating these different selves based on different desires. And if the desire is unskillful, is that a self you want to keep in, the, in your stable? The answer should be no. So in the meantime, you create another set of skills around the meditation. Yourself as a meditator. Yourself as someone who is mindful and alert. And that can change the balance of power inside. When you're not spending so much time competing outside, it's a lot easier to let go of a lot of the selves that hang on to that competition, or are based on that competition. At the very least, if you do have to compete, which is a normal part of everyday life, you learn how to take those selves and pick them up and put them down. If you find that they start getting unskillful, you can put them down. Because you see there are activities, there are things you do. They're not something you're stuck with. They're actions you choose to do. And when you can see that they're uns unskillful and unnecessary, then you can let them go. So this is one of the advantages of meditation. It gives you a place to stand. It gives you a sense of well-being inside that requires no competition whatsoever. So you can look at the competitions of life and decide, well, which ones do you really want to get involved with? What are the long-term consequences? So when the Buddha says you develop insight, you develop discernment in the meditation. It's just that. You're able to see long-term consequences.
and make your choices based on that long-term view. And you're in a position where you can look at the long term. It's like someone who's well fed. They're able to look off a little bit further into the future than people who don't have anything to eat at all. If you don't have nothing to eat, you're constantly scrambling for this, scrambling for that. You get what you can take, however you take it. But if you're well fed, you can be a little bit more discriminating, a little bit more wise. about where you're going to look for your food. So meditation is food for the mind. At the same time, it makes your insight into what's going on in the mind right here a lot clearer. So take some time to be with the breath and allow the breath to be comfortable. Allow that sense of comfort to spread th throughout the body. And then do what you can to maintain that sense of full body comfort, full body breathing, full body awareness. Because it puts you in a much better position to decide, well, what do you really want in life? What's really important? What do you really want to hold on to? And what's worth letting go? This way the different battles that go on in the mind about what you want, what you don't want, get sorted out. Because you're standing in a better place. This basis of well-being inside that you can create very simply by being mindful and alert to the breath. relating to the body, relating to the mind. In a way that's a lot more skillful and gives a foundation for a lot more skillful actions as you go into the world. <laughs>